Well, welcome to our RLI session on crisis leadership. My name is Frank Lexa. I'm the chief medical officer of the RLI, and I'm a neuroradiologist and academics, and I'm also a business school professor in the Philadelphia area. And this is a timely topic because as we put this together, as our team put it together, we are living through the COVID uh, crisis here in the United States. And what we're gonna be doing today is talking about crisis leadership. And I wanna to try to give you a big perspective as we go into this. Um, this is a picture from the earthquake that occurred in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1980s. And I had just moved from the Bay Area to Philadelphia at the time. I got a call from a friend who said, Frank, you know, the big earthquake just hit the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, you should probably try to reach your friends. Um, and I tried, and of course, the telephone circuits were overwhelmed. I turned on the TV, which happened to be focused in the area because the World Series was uh, scheduled to take place. And I looked out and obviously this was a terrible crisis. Um, people ended up dying. There's a big fire where you can see the smoke from the Marina district of the city. But one of the first things that I noticed was that it wasn't the big one because having gone to school on an earthquake fault, medical school on an earthquake fault, um, we had been told that the bridges would probably go down when the big earthquake finally hit San Francisco. And in an analogy to COVID, um, the people who study viruses will also tell us that this could be worse and that there are worse possibilities out there. And it's just a reminder that these kinds of things do recur. There are going to be more earthquakes in San Francisco and there are gonna be other virus pandemics and perhaps more during your careers. And so it's important that we address these issues and understand how to lead in a crisis. And when I, my son asked me for a quote about the crisis for something he was doing in college, and I happened to have recently re -seen, the, you know, seen this movie again, and this really sort of pulled at me, so I just thought I would share this with you, because I'm sure some of you who are dealing with this, those of you who are working at the tip of the spear, um, understand that we don't get to choose the times um, that we live in but we do have to decide what we're going to do about them and how to um, do the best we can with the time that's given to us. So with that, let's talk about leadership. And this is sort of leadership with a capital L, um, which is leadership during crisis and challenges. And pre-COVID, I, you know, there's still plenty of things that we were facing in 2020. 2020 was destined to be a challenging year for US radiology anyway. And some of the other things that we've been addressing in the RLI include corporatization, changes in reimbursement, which were scheduled to go down this year, um, new regulatory demands that are being thrown at us in 2020, um, issues of generational conflicts and how to you know, work well together in a time where um, generations are changing and we have some practices we have three or even four generations as they're defined by the US Census working together. Um, the threats from AI and other uh, ways that tech is going to change how we work and perhaps uh, in some cases replace some of what we do. Um, something that I've done a uh, fair amount of research on in burnout and understanding how we can continue to work effectively and have successful careers despite the onslaught of uh, clinical work that we're facing. And then issues like the one at the bottom, and the one at the bottom is the only one that I made up, but uh, certainly other types of conflict in medicine. And as we move forward, my goals for the next 27 or 28 minutes now is to talk about some common fallacies in how we think about med medical leadership understand that everyone who's watching this, who works in radiology has the opportunity to be a leader and to do leadership work, even if you don't have a job title with leader in it, like being a chair, section chief, um, one of those types of roles. We'll understand how good leadership is the secret to how we deal with these challenges and crises. And understand again, that while this is a particularly uh, challenging and tough time in US medicine, 
Um, if you're going to be working for 20 or 30 or more years, you're going to see other things like this again. We'll discuss the importance of good leadership skills and team management as their essential ingredients in how you manage a crisis successfully. And we'll talk about how you can build effective team relationships and work with administration and physicians and other disciplines. This is a book that addresses some of these issues if you want to learn more about this. Now, one of the questions that I get a lot as a radiologist, and this is sort of something I've heard a lot during my 25 year career now, is, you know, should radiologists or should physicians be leaders? And this is, there's some controversy here. And the first time I heard somebody say this explicitly was actually outside the United States um, in another English speaking country, but I've certainly heard this in the US as well, which is that radiologists should just stick to their craft. They should focus on being radiologists, they should stay in the reading room, and leave the business and leadership work to others. And you know, I've, I don't like this idea. We have a radiology leadership institute specifically because we do need better radiology leaders and we wanna help people succeed. But I sort of think that it's analogous to this industry. And in the Philadelphia area where I currently live, it's one of the places where the locovore movement started in dining because there's so much good food that's produced relatively close to Philadelphia. And actually this building is um, less than 100 miles away, and this is down at the Pennsylvania-Delaware border, and that's one of the US centers for this industry. And in this industry, they're, they're making mushrooms in those buildings, and the way you make mushrooms is you keep them in the dark and you put manure on them, and that's kind of what I think this first school is talking about. You know, Just let, leave the leadership and the crisis management um, you know, leave that up to us and you just uh, stay in your rooms and read your CTs. Now, I actually take the opposite view and it's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about the Radiology Leadership Institute because I think we're elite professionals who do difficult things and we really need to be led by those, you know, our own, people who understand what it's like to do this at three o'clock in the morning. And I think it's analogous, analogous to these types of people. Um, I had a good friend from medical school who got to be an astronaut, and I'm really jealous of that, but astronauts are always uh, led by other astronauts, other people who've had to do the kinds of difficult things that they do. Uh, one of the people in my family got to fly fighter planes for the United States Air Force, and they are always led by their own. And I think that's the way that we should work as well, and that's one of the reasons why we have leadership training in the ROI. Now, why do we need leaders? Slightly different question, but also important, and particularly important in a crisis, because in a crisis, more than ever, you need leadership. It's leadership on steroids, and it's for many reasons. You know, you start you start off thinking, well, you know, you're a good interventional radiologist, you're a good breast radiologist. Do you really need somebody micromanaging you? No, that's not what leadership is. But you do need leadership for group performance, for group cohesion. Um, increasingly, we need to be able to work well with the hospital and the medical school, and certainly as you look at what's happened in the U.S. since this uh, pandemic occurred, the hospitals that have done better are ones where people work well together, and that certainly um, there are hospitals where there's been a lot of conflict and where bad things have happened, and it's often because leaders aren't getting along with each other, particularly the non-physician leadership with the uh, physicians and other medical professionals. And there are many other things that leaders do, and that really forms sort of the core curriculum of what we teach in the RLI, but there are other things like strategic thinking, managing conflict, planning, mentoring, et cetera. And many of these things have been part of the success or failure stories that we're hearing about how US medicine is responding to the pandemic. And other things that they do, you know, again, planning and preparation, um, managing people, particularly people who are stressed, is not easy. Um, part of it is being a role model, leading by example, and the ability to negotiate, to represent, and to resolve conflict. These are all the keys to doing well in leadership generally, but again, when there's a crisis, you really see whether it's working or not, and it becomes not just important, but it's critical to success or failure. Now, I used to say, this is an older quote, but it is certainly spot on for what we're dealing with right now, 
which is leadership in quotes is easy in good times. If you're fortunate enough to live in a time where you don't have a COVID, you don't have major changes from the government, and not, not very much exciting happens, leadership can be pretty easy in those times. Now, we don't usually have those times. We usually have something going on. There's always somebody who wants to change what's going on in medicine, or we face challenges because people are getting older and or sicker, or the government's running out of money. Um, there's usually something going on, but certainly as it gets tougher, as crises occur, then you really need leadership with a capital L. And these are the times that will define us. And how we react to this kind of a crisis determines whether or not we are really leaders or we're just people with titles. And they define you. And people remember. And in other crises that I've lived through, um, we forever remember what our chair did right or what they did wrong or why things fell apart or why they succeeded and got promoted or why they got fired. And I just wanna emphasize, and it's what I opened with, that the reason for this talk, one of the reasons for it is that these are not accidents or aberrations. If you have an important job, you are going to see crises in the future. And one of the, the things that's just one of the biggest lies we can try to tell ourselves is to say, well, this is a once in a generation or once in a lifetime kind of event. There will be more recessions. There have been a lot of recessions since the US Civil War, and there will be more, just like the one that we're now having in reaction to the crisis. There will be more earthquakes in San Francisco. That one wasn't the first one, it won't be the last. And there will be more hurricanes that do major damage. And to say that, you know, it's, well, this is a once in a lifetime event. Um, in these cases, that's not true. And we have to prepare and work towards being able to handle the next one better and to always improve and to be ready for what's gonna happen next. And the first step, <clears throat> And you will find this pretty much in every business book you read about how to manage, how to lead, how to succeed, is first get the right people and to build a good team and optimize what they do. And it's the difference between having an elite team versus just a group of people. And to understand that in, a, particularly in a crisis, but even in just more in the day-to-day, -day, more mundane things that hospitals and radiology practices, academic departments need to do, understand that there's a big difference between high function versus cohesive versus in the worst case, dysfunction. And it's one of the things that separates great successful departments from mediocre departments and from dysfunctional you know, departments. Same thing with, with practice groups. In a crisis, you can't afford to have dysfunction. In mediocrity, usually isn't enough in a crisis. So this is where you really need to have the right people. And you know, it's very interesting to talk to friends who are you know, at different centers in the crisis, to go and look on social media and look at news reports to see what's going on. And you really get, uh, I think, a very strong sense of which places are getting it right, doing leadership well, succeeding despite the challenges, and which ones aren't. So, you know, the crisis is really one of the, you know, true tests of leadership, and you can see it happening in the U.S. today. And again, every business book usually has a chapter in the beginning that's about getting the right people. Sometimes it's turned around and they say, get rid of the wrong people. Um, one of them uses an analogy of a bus, which is to get the right people on the bus, the right people off the bus. Um, most of us don't have that luxury, at least not in the midst of a crisis, but we certainly then want to try to help everyone to contribute, work on team dynamics. If you have people who aren't helpful, at least minimize their roles and maximize the roles of the people who are stepping up. You need to set group norms and expectations. We see very interesting ways that people in radiology are now cooperating across the silos in a hospital to get things done in the successful models, and then also just be a role model for the group. You personally, if you're involved in this, understanding safety and quality and operational excellence so that it's leading by example. It's not um, being like some people in the administration who may be at their vacation homes while other people are working in the ICU, but to really 
you know, to be a role model for your group and your institution. Um, next, you want to look at what you need to do most. And this has really been, I think, highlighted in um, you know, the past several weeks. You know, understanding what needs to be done first and to you know, do what you need to do to open up the ICUs, to expand them where you can, if you have the equipment to do so and you have the people to do so, rethink you know, how you're scheduling people. And whenever you have a list of things to do, you can kind of build a matrix and in a crisis, you have to do what's urgent and important. You have to make sure that you're doing triage effectively. You have to make sure that you're using PPE appropriately. Um, you need to watch for cross-infection. You need to make decisions about how you're going to use your equipment differently. Um, you know, if you can, taking your doing scans or taking X-rays in a different way so that you you know can both speed things up and also limit the use of PPE. Um, you just have to understand that you can't do everything. Unless you're remarkably rich, you're going to have limitations on people, limitations on equipment, and you need to make these decisions. And again, as you go through this, it may be the time where you defer um, non-urgent biopsies. It may be the time when you defer non-urgent surgeries. And it may be a time when you decide that, you know, we're going to reconfigure the reading rooms or we're going to do something else so that we can you know, keep our people safe with social distancing, but also get the work done. Now, when you're leading change, um, I think sometimes it's helpful, particularly the first time you have to do this and the first time you're taking on a leadership role, um, it's helpful to have a paradigm. It's helpful to have a list, just like you may want to have um, a paradigm the first time you're going to dictate a complicated neuro-oncology uh, report so that you make sure that you cover the right things and you don't miss anything. And so when I think about you know, a paradigm for young leaders, for first time leaders, or for leaders who just wanna get better, um, one of the ones that I like is from these two gentle, gentlemen. And um, they wrote this relatively short book, um, great title. Um, and it's, you know, how you can do leadership, project-oriented leadership, in this case, crisis leadership, um, when you're not in charge. You know, when you haven't been doing this for 10 years and you're a seasoned chair and you've seen just about everything and you can handle just about everything. Um, and this gives you a paradigm, just like a, a checklist for a neurotrauma case um, or a spine oncology case. And it runs you through five phases of what you need to do in a crisis project type of leadership role. And the five steps are purpose, thinking, learning, engagement, and feedback. That sounds simple and straightforward. And if you follow these steps, you'll be a much more effective crisis leader. And just uh, to give you just a brief background on Roger Fisher, he's a remarkable individual. He actually negotiated the first major uh, strategic arms limitation talks between the Soviet Union and the United States and um, made the world a bit safer by doing that and reducing the number of nuclear weapons that were aimed at each other. So he does know what he's talking about and he's very good. Now, first with purpose, this sounds straightforward, but it's the key to getting it right from the beginning, which is you first have to have a clear aim. And the aim may be, we wanna figure out how we can better triage patients and decide who needs to get scans and who doesn't, and how we can do that without overwhelming the amount of PPE we're using or um, the amount of personnel we need to, to use. Now, and this has to be a clear aim, specific and quantifiable. And just to give you some examples, a different algorithm or a different mnemonic for this is that these things should be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, convenient acronym if you like acronyms. Um, but this will help with clarifying how you can actually carry this out. And just to give you some examples you know, of goals, you know, being a good radiology department or a better radiology department sounds good. No one would argue with that, but it's not a great goal. 
because it doesn't meet these sort of smart criteria. It's not very specific. People can probably sit down over lunch and come up with you know, five different definitions of what good means, depending on what they wanna see happen. And in a crisis, you do need to focus and come to an agreement. And so something has to be specific. It also helps if it's measurable. Um, saying we're gonna improve our IT services so that everyone can work from home, which has happened in some places, at least most people can work from home. Good idea, but again, improving, it's, you know, this is kind of nebulous and we wanna be specific. We wanna reduce wait time for getting reports back and answering calls, that's better because that does meet the measurable attainable. And if we wanna reduce our outpatient queues um, for MRI, that's better but we wanna make sure that we meet the SMART criteria. And that you know, covers the purpose part. Then we move on and we talk about thinking. And that's not a misprint, but it is this notion that we first have to really think this through. And we have to think, well, if we make these changes, are we gonna be able to support them? If we expand the ICU beds by X, or we, do we have the personnel to cover them? Do we have the ventilators to cover them? Are there ways that we can make this work? But you just want to, you don't want to jump right in and say, well, we need to do X. We want to think about all the implications of X. In almost all of these cases, this is going to involve teamwork. And particularly in a crisis, people roll up their sleeves, people cross cover. And the normal ways of doing things when you have a more luxury of time and less urgency um, tend to change. So you got to think about who's going to help you. You need that to think about that team. Again, if something meets the SMART criteria, there's gonna be measuring. And whether the measuring is um, how quickly we turn over the CT scanner that we're using to look at people's lungs or whatever you're trying to look at, just make sure that you've thought about how you're gonna quantify this. Think about how you're gonna implement the project and think if you have the expertise to do this. Do we really have somebody who knows how to jury rig this kind of complicated ventilator system or not. Um, with learning, this means that you don't just make a decision. You don't just give people an order and say, well, everybody's gonna work this way. It means you pay attention as you change things. It means that you look at what's happening and you keep track of the results. And sometimes you get unexpected results. Um, are you having you know, problems with some technology? Is something slowing down because you're doing an intervention? If you're tying up resources in one area, what are the consequences elsewhere? And are people working together? Or are they fighting? Are they dragging their feet? Are they being passive aggressive? And really taking a look at all of the implications. And this requires a, a different kind of a leadership because this is leadership that involves close attention and not just telling people what to do, but understanding that once you make changes, once you disturb the status quo, you may have unintended consequences. And it, the notion of engagement means that it can't just be you with a good idea. You may, as a radiologist, come up with a fantastic way of managing in a crisis, but you still have to have a group of people to carry it out and to make sure that it works. And leadership and management is about getting a group of people to do the right thing. And it's about pulling the team together. And if you can, you choose the right people. And again, if you don't have a perfect team and most of us don't, you just try to very quickly help people get up to speed do some mentoring, do some intervention to make sure that they're doing the right stuff and make sure they all have roles and tasks. It's also important that you have a diverse team and that's diversity in many ways, including diversity of outlook. Um, that's a picture from a major crisis in US history. That's from the Cuban Missile Crisis. And fortunately there were people in the room, not everybody in the room agreed that bombing Cuba was a great idea, which turns out that would have been a terrible idea and some other people in the room came up with better ideas and avoided a nuclear war in, in the 1960s with the Soviet Union over that. Final phase, which we usually overlook, and it's a subject for a separate talk, is the notion of what do you do after the crisis? And again, one of the most important things for you is going to be that once this is over, you as a generation, us as a generation, we're gonna be better prepared for the next one, hopefully because we will have lived through this. 
And it's sort of like the scene in a recent movie um, um, about the bin Laden um, action where when the SEALs lose control of their helicopter and the helicopter is going to crash and one of them says, how many of you have been in a helo crash and other hands go up? Once you've been through one of these things, you're right, you know, it, it just gives you an edge the next time something happens. So it's important that you analyze this and learn from it. Think about how other people did. Think about how well you did. Think about what went wrong. Use 360 degree feedback to kind of understand well, how did I do? How did other people do? Because then you learn, and then you have an edge when it happens again. And just some closing ideas about how to succeed in a crisis or as a change leader. Again, you got to manage yourself first. You got to keep yourself under control so that you can help other people deal with the crisis. You got to stay focused. The crisis is what you have to be doing. This is not the time to worry about things that just don't meet the urgent and important category like you know, staying up on your CME and stuff like that. It's a time to build a great team. It's a time to have a plan, to use it, improve it. Shouldn't be worried if the plan isn't perfect. They're never perfect. And you, know, you can lose small fights, but what matters is winning in the crisis, winning the war. And you know, as you plan to lead, and hopefully maybe you'll get other types of leadership training from the RLI, we help you plan to lead, and hopefully you'll learn how to lead from that and to lead the way you were trained. And if you can, if, if you're going to change things in an ED and you're in a place that has five hospitals, you start with one, get it right, and then rapidly roll it out into the others. You have a plan, adjust it. Again, find the right people, try to fix people if you need to, and do your best, but don't be disappointed if you're less than perfect because in a crisis, you just want things to get better and you need to move quickly and you don't have time for perfection. Just do the best you can. So in conclusion, hopefully you'll learn to manage yourself and focus on the crisis as well as the bigger bigger picture. Challenges are not mere obstacles. They're also, they are opportunities and we will certainly learn a lot from this one. And I hope that this helps you get um, ready for the next one, use them to make things better, and always remember your oath, take care of your patients, and take care of yourself and your team even in the midst of a crisis. So with that, we want to thank you very much, and we hope to see you again and hear you, have you involved in other things with the RLI. Thank you.